Hey everyone, my name is Sam Corris and I direct research for our Autonomous Technology and Robotics section. We're going to be diving into reusable rockets today and I want to thank our associate Daniel McGuire for all his help on this research. So reusable rockets are so important because they're lowering launch costs and changing the economics of space. And according to our research, satellite connectivity revenues could approach $130 billion in 2030. And that's just a fraction of the $2 trillion spent in telecommunications. At the end, we'll also talk about some longer-term opportunities in space, which could mean some hypersonic point-to-point -point, uh, travel and logistics, which could generate revenues of $35 billion in 2030, uh, and potentially far more as we go out. To understand the dramatic impact of launch cost decline, I think it's important to understand the recent history of the launch industry. And so if you look back to 2006, uh, we had two ways of getting to space, really. We were either relying on the Russian Soyuz rocket uh, or ULA's Atlas V rocket. And both of those costs increased dramatically over the following decade. So between 2006 and 2015, uh, the Soyuz rocket went from roughly $71 million to $210 million, and the Atlas V went from $118 million to $164 million. And so when the Falcon 9 first launched uh, around 2015, the price point that it was coming in at was not revolutionary. In fact, it was kind of just resetting back to what should be possible if you got rid of you know, cost bloat from a monopolistic industry. And so it was resetting the stage. It wasn't revolutionary. But then they started reusing these rockets, and we saw launch costs continue to decline. And so it totally turned the industry on its head because costs had been rising for so long, and now all of a sudden we're in a new paradigm where costs are declining, and people are wondering, you know, is there more demand for satellite launches as launch costs decline? And I think we're seeing pretty clearly that the answer is yes. And I think the important point here, and you can see, is that launch costs have come down so far, and we don't think it's done. We think that with Starship and, and this next generation of bigger reusable rockets, uh, we can get the costs down by an order of magnitude or two. I think getting, getting to that second organ, uh, order of magnitude decrease will be quite difficult, um, but it's, it's certainly within the realm of possibilities. And so why is it important to look at this refurbishment time? Um, when looking at rockets in particular, I think this is a great, easy-to-track metric that correlates quite well with the actual cost. Uh, and so, you know, again, just comparing this to the historical uh, example out there, the space shuttle cost roughly $1.5 billion per launch, and they just assumed that, you know, reusable rockets were going to be economically impossible. You can go back, you listen to earnings calls in the 2015 time period, and you have you know, CEOs of space companies out there saying, we've done the math, it doesn't make sense. Um, even if it's possible, it's not economic. Uh, and SpaceX has certainly flipped that script. And so looking at our research, you know, the first stage of the Falcon 9, uh, we believe costs less than a million dollars to refurbish now. And rocket turnaround time is continuing to increase. And so you can see SpaceX, the first time they turned a rocket around, it was roughly a year. Um, and you know, they got that down to 21 days in 2022. 25 days was the fastest in 2023. But if you look at the chart here um, on the right side, uh, it's been declining every year on average. And so these lower launch costs should enable continuous global coverage with low latency. And I, you know, this is a, a fairly straightforward slide in concept, but I think it's really important to understand, especially if you're, you're new to the space or you're just looking into space for the first time. Uh, there's these two main orbits uh, that help conceptualize why lower launch costs are enabling new uh, connectivity. And so you can see you have the Earth, uh, and for a long time, a lot of satellites going up there 
we're going up into geo, so geosynchronous or geostationary orbit. And that's where you have one satellite 22,000 miles away from the Earth, and it's so far away, it's covering roughly a third of the Earth, and as the Earth turns, it's staying in the exact same spot. So you can launch three of these up, and you get global coverage. But since they're so far away, uh, there's high latency. So it takes time for a signal to travel from Earth 22,000 miles up uh, and back. And so you know, doing video calls or, or something like that, providing internet service was buggy. Uh, but it works for things where latency isn't as important, such as uh, DISH TV or something broadcasting. Uh, with low Earth orbit, or LEO, uh, you can see those are quite close to the Earth, just 300 to 400 miles above the surface. And so you need to launch uh, a handful, dozens, uh, or in SpaceX case, thousands, in order to get global continuous coverage. But uh, the key benefit here is that it's close to Earth, so you can have low bandwidth, or high, high bandwidth, low latency. And uh, the economics here are important. So with geostationary, you were launching satellites the size of school buses. Uh, they could cost more than the rocket launch its cost. So you could have 200 to 300 million dollar satellites being launched on you know, a rocket that costs 100 million dollars. But with low Earth orbit, you're getting much less expensive satellites, so in the hundreds of thousands of dollars range. Uh, but you need to launch a lot of them. And so you need launch costs to come down for low Earth orbit to be economic, where you can afford to send up multiple uh, rockets carrying all of these different satellites. Uh, another interesting dynamic here is that the closer you are to Earth, uh, the faster these, or these uh, satellites can deorbit. And so if you were to do nothing, um, a satellite in low Earth orbit would fall back to Earth in roughly five years, as opposed to if it were in geostationary orbit, uh, it would fall back to Earth within a thousand or more years. And so, you know, people are actively having to deorbit satellites to make sure there's not too much space junk out there. Uh, but this is a nice little benefit of having uh, satellites in low Earth orbit is that you can have them degrade in a, in a sensible fashion. And so this kind of ties into Starship. So Starship is SpaceX's next generation rocket. Uh, we've seen some of the test launches. They've been super exciting. Uh, and I think one of the interesting things is even without Starship, SpaceX is completely dominating the up mass. Uh, and so you can see here the up mass to orbit, uh, SpaceX already accounts for 80% of that. And that's, that's a global number, so that's very impressive. And now you're going to have Starship, which has a payload capacity of you know, roughly five times the Falcon 9. And uh, a question that is out there is saying, OK, you have all of this extra capacity. Um, is there demand to fill it? Right? Are we just going to Mars? Are we building a lunar station? Uh, but I think it's, it's important to look at the Starlink constellation. And you can say that uh, if you're going to have 42,000 satellites in orbit for Starlink, and they're going to deorbit every five years, you need Starship to be launching every roughly three and a half days just to keep launching new satellites to replenish that constellation. And to put that in context, in 2023, the Falcon 9 uh, launched every you know, 3.8 days. And their goal for 2024 is to launch every two and a half days. So Starship isn't just necessary for us to get to the moon and to Mars. Uh, I think it's going to be you know, really important for expanding the Starlink constellation to its full potential of 42,000 satellites. And who knows, maybe even beyond that. So we've been talking about large rockets, right? Starship, the, the biggest of them all. Uh, but there's a lot of stuff happening with small launch providers, and we can't ignore that either. And so small launch providers did proliferate, 
Uh, but we don't think that they are the winners in space. And they do certainly uh, provide an important role. But what we saw was there was a lot of capital that came in and that created a boom in companies, which is great. That's how you get a lot of innovation. Uh, but after this capital spending boom, industries tend to consolidate. And in the space industry, we're starting to see that happening. And really, the, the launch business is not a great business. It's necessary but not sufficient is how I would put it. And so it's, you know, it's critical. You know, if we don't have rockets, we're not getting to space. But the real exciting things are the constellations, the services, the in-orbit manufacturing, other types of things that are enabled by having cheap access to space. And so here you can see uh, the proliferation and then the kind of halt of small launch provide or small launch founding companies. Uh, and on the right side, you can see you know, how few of them have actually executed into uh, something that is currently active. The other part of the Starlink equation or any other constellation that's trying to provide services is the antenna cost. And so this is the piece that a customer would buy. Uh, and if this is too expensive, then it, it makes the economics quite difficult of acquiring new customers. And so SpaceX, you know, actually this, this might be out of date. I need to check because uh, they have actively been lowering their prices and offering different uh, options, uh, but lower antenna costs are going to allow SpaceX to s continue to scale without having such a high customer acquisition cost where they're subsidizing the and antenna. Uh, and you can see, you know, we talk about rights law a lot with batteries, uh, with vehicles. Uh, this applies to Starlink antennas as well. Um, and at least from what we've seen so far, these costs should continue to decline with every cumulative doubling of production. And on the right, you can see that Starlink is having uh, very good success with its growth. And you can see it, it kind of started off a little bit slow. Uh, but now the trajectory uh, seems pretty strong as it continues up and to the right. Uh, if we want to look at the market opportunity here and how we got to that $130 billion revenue number per year. Uh, here's a breakdown. And I think one that people are particularly excited about is this direct to device. So this is being able to pull out your smartphone and having service anywhere in the world. Um, you know, not necessarily for browsing the internet right now, but potential for a phone call in a remote area, an emergency text. Um, Obviously, this would be a low revenue opportunity on a monthly basis. Uh, but we think that this could extend to almost all cellular customers. And that would be a $48 billion opportunity annually. And if you look at the chart on the right, you can see satellite subscribers as a percent of cellular subscribers. And it's been flat kind of in that cost period of rising rocket costs that we spoke about before, you know, that 2006 to 2015 and even beyond that. Um, when SpaceX rolls out direct-to-device with T-Mobile, we think this jumps up to roughly 1%. But realistically, the way we think this plays out is every telco provider out there is going to bundle this. You won't even know that you're paying you know, 50 cents a month for this. And they'll be offering you something like emergency SOS messaging anywhere in the world. Um, and then, you know, we think that this could go to 100%. Uh, and you can see the other opportunities here, this connectivity uh, to broadband across the world. Uh, that's a higher per month cost, but another $40 billion opportunity. The RV opportunity, boating, commercial flights. And if we sum all of this up, that's how we get to that roughly $130 billion per year opportunity. And then something that's a, a little bit further out, but we also think is exciting, and we've heard about some opportunities here, uh, is this hypersonic point-to-point -point logistics and flight. Um, and so the Department of Transportation did a study, and they found that leisure travelers are willing to spend 60 to 90% of their estimated hourly income 
to save one hour. And so if you look at the time savings that you can get flying across the world, right, you can go from 28 hours round trip to potentially six hours if you're on a hypersonic rocket. Uh, so you'd save 22 hours. And given the typical cost and potential time savings, uh, you know, this suggests that a first class passenger should be willing to spend $44,000 for a round trip hypersonic flight. And so if you just do some very uh, back of the envelope, top down modeling here, you can say, okay, there's 6.7 billion people who are flying. We're not going to take a hypersonic flight to go, you know, New York to Florida. So you got to look long haul. Uh, so that gets you to 335 million passengers on long haul flights. How many of those are actually first class passengers? That brings you down to 16 million. What is the adoption at maturity? Uh, and that's how we get to 8 million individuals. And then that ticket price, which we just went through, is that $44,000. Uh, and that's how we get to this annual addressable market of $350 billion. And we think that in 2030, this really could just be the beginning of this. Uh, and that's how we get to that $35 billion number in 2030. And so that's a lot we've run through about reusable rockets, space, uh, and if you have any questions, you know, we're on Twitter, um, ping us, and you know, we'd love to engage and discuss interesting topics. If you think there's an area where we should be researching more or questions, uh, we'd love to hear it.